Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I am delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leader series, Innovative Dewatering Method for Mining Waste. My name is Megan Purdy and I'll be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders, past and present and emerging. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Geofabrics. Geofabrics is Australasia's geosynthesis specialist. They help their clients deliver and maintain infrastructure by minimising risk and increasing value through the innovative use of geosynthetic products. Geofabrics have supported the Australasian infra infrastructure sector on significant projects from the Victorian Level Crossing Removal Projects to APLNG in Queensland to the Christchurch Gondola in New Zealand. On these projects and every project they undertake, they have a singular focus to provide smarter infrastructure solutions. Now today, we will be hearing from two speakers followed by our live audience Q&A. So I encourage you all to send your questions through to our speakers via the chat box. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker, Ben Lewis. Ben holds a degree in civil and structural engineering from the University of Adelaide with a focus in geotechnical engineering. Ben currently focuses in finding and optimizing solutions to the mine, water and waste industries through use of geosynthetics. His objective in his current role is to find sustainable and economical solutions that don't compromise performance of the asset that they are designed to protect or contain while minimizing impact to the environment. So please join me in welcoming Ben Lewis. My name is Ben Lewis. I'm the business development manager for mining and water at Geofabrics. Um, covers a whole range of things, but Today, I'll be focusing on uh, geotube dewatering and really targeting how that applies to the mining sector and, and tailings management and I suppose some other, some other applications. Uh, and after, we're, after I've spoken, we'll have Charles Villiers as well, talking uh, from a perspective, I suppose, of, um, of e-engineers uh, and geotechnical perspective and, and risk management. So today uh, I'll be running through what is the function of a geotube, uh, common geotube applications, mine site benefits and uses, typical misconceptions, do's and don'ts, what to avoid, what to make sure you're doing, um, and then focusing also on, on tailing storage geotube farms versus uh, mechanical dewatering methods, so belt filter systems and really doing a bit direct comparison of the two methods for tailings dewatering, and then also focusing on um, CO2 emissions, just a brief look overview of that. And then also looking at limitations of this particular method in the tailings sector. So going, I suppose, directly to the function of it. Um, how does it function? It's basically a big porous geotextile tube, which is pumped full of slurries. Um, and the water comes out of that geotex geotextile tube and the solids are designed to stay inside. Uh, could be a whole range of different types of slurries, could be tailings, could be biosolids, um, could be marine sediments, contaminated material, all sorts. And the aim is to basically make it a spadeable consistency for a whole range of um, purposes. Could be stacking, could be burying, could be reuse, um, uh, could be a whole range of things, which I'll, I'll delve into. And when it comes to, I suppose, the dewatering mechanism, you've got active and passive dewatering. So active is obviously when it's being pumped full and you've got this sort of heavy flows that should be coming out of the geotextile. And passive is basically when it's, when you're not pumping into that particular bag, you might've diverted to a different bag and you get this passive weeping effect, which could be, it's not as visually obvious, but you do get that ongoing passive weeping after you've stopped pumping into that bag. So you can see, see here, uh, these both these are both active dewatering um, applications. So this this bag on the right would be being pumped at the time. It's coming out quite well. That looks pretty good, but when you compare it to the other this other side, uh, it's flushing out a lot better. And it really depends on the type of solids you're pumping in. I would expect in tailings, 
you, know, you, you might have a SODS, which is predominantly granular. Uh, you might have something that's predominantly silty. So it, it does depend, but at the end of the day, um, it's going to achieve a spadeable consistency. It just might take, you know, instead of taking a week, it might take two weeks to achieve something that's ready for, for stacking. And then you've got this consolidation effect, uh, which you would then, obviously, you get to that stage where it's dried, and spadeable, and then you'd either bury and cap over this geotextile tube, depending on the size of the application or, or the site, or you cut open and dispose of, the, of this dried cake, we call it, or, um, and then disposing of that geotextile tube. But in the mining sector, I suppose what we're really going to be doing, I would expect, is uh, leaving it in situ if you're doing it on a, whole, on a wider scale of tailings production or tailings dewatering um, and burying it, or in some cases that tailings material does have value. So um, you might have one platform and another platform uh, with geotextile bags and you are cutting them open, reprocessing it, selling that material as a byproduct or, or a value, valuable product. So uh, just looking at the processes for geotube, geotube dewatering, you've basically got your platform preparation, which is cutting and filling this platform, which is a really critical part component. You're lining it with a suitable uh, geomembrane liner, suitable for the contaminated material, whatever it is. Um, then you are putting your geotubes, setting up your geotubes on there, you're pumping and you're dredging your tailings material into those tubes. Could be a sediment, could be from a sediment pond, which I'll, I'll delve into in a minute. Um, and then you're dosing and flocculating. So I'll just go to this chart over here on the right. You can see that um, it just explains really where you would need dosing and maybe not dosing with chemical. Uh, most tailings application would be dosing with a some kind of flocculant or a coagulant to start with anyway, to sort of help and thicken out in a wet storage um, application. But for our particular application, we tend to want a, um, a different type of flock, which is gonna produce a larger particle size. And in some cases, like marine applications where you're dealing with sand, um, that tends to be a self-settling material. And in those cases, you may not need flocks. So flocks, obviously, you'd like to avoid it if you can um, because of the cost implications. But uh, in most cases, you do tend to need the, the flock just to avoid clogging and, and, and uh, improving that dewatering. And then you've got this filling, so filling and cycling process. So the, that bottom chart shows you've got this filling to the max fill height or your maximum volume. It'll drop down as it passively dewaters, and then you pump it up again with this active process, and then it cycles through maybe um, two, three, four, five times. And it really depends on how fast you're filling that bag, how fast the water's coming out, um, and it is hard to predict as well. So the slower you fill it, generally the better, because you'll need less cycles. Um, and I've already sort of explained that active and passive dewatering process. Monitoring and cleaning is an important process as well, generally speaking. You know, biosolids projects where we're pumping it full of biosolids, which tends to want to retain the moisture, even with flock, might um, might take extra cleaning of scum off the surface, but it does promote dewatering once you get the agitation of the surface. Um, in mining applications, look, probably need less cleaning because it's going to be um, pretty consistently flocked, and then you've got this this sediment which tends not to hold hold moisture as well. And I know we're dealing with very fine materials typically too. And then you've got excavation, disposal, capping, and closure. So I've delved into that a little bit, but you've got a few options there. So this is just a schematic of the, the, the process, I suppose. You've got a, a, a plan view, you've got the dewatering platform, which could be as big as it needs to be, really. But in some cases, these mining operations we're looking at at the moment, maybe 200 by 100 meter platform uh, designed to be quite level. And I'll run through those uh, and the importance of that as well. And then you've got your effluent pond, which would just be a temporary storage for that water that's going to be filter, filtering from the bag, and that can get, be recycled through the uh, through the system. You've got your polymer makedown system, which is where we're diluting the flock and then pumping that back into your slurry line, which you can see on the on the left there is a, sl a slurry source or a sludge source, which would be your tailings and the tailings application. And then you are dosing with your flock, running through a, uh, a inline mixing process, which isn't shown on there, but then going through a series of, of manifolds and uh, into your geotube stack, essentially, uh, with what do you call them, um, pinch valves to divert flows as needed. 
Uh, and this is just a typical view of a, of a typical geotube stack or a setup. You've got your manifolds um, and your incoming slurry pipe, your lay flat hose, which would then run from your manifold onto the into the geotube. You've got a probably a five meter working area surrounding it with a, a lined platform. You can see there's a, a plastic liner there and you've got your geotube. And on the right, you've got your geo, a typical geotube stack. I think that's probably about 220 meters long by 70 meters. Uh, wide or deep, we can go. We can make geotubes up to the size of about 100 meters, as has been done in the past, which is uh, about 3,000 cubes at 80 meters width. Um, and then you design your stack accordingly, reducing the size as you go up. And this is just a, a typical picture of what you'd expect to achieve once it's spadeable. Um, in some cases, it's not going to be as dry, but in others. Depending on the on your material, it should be very spadeable, um, and that is the key. Really, we want this. We want to achieve a moisture content which is going to make it safe for stacking, if that's what you want to do, or get to a moisture content which is suitable for reuse, disposal, selling, um, and we can do testing in the lab to assess to help assess uh, the rate of drying as well. Or you could do an on-site trial to to help assist with that. Uh, and then we're also also looking at the shear strength of material if if stacking is is required. You can actually test the shear strength and the addition of flocculants will actually assist with that too. So typical geotube applications, which you may be more familiar with, are, are basically using the bags to store dredge spoil from rivers or ports, uh, using them to de-sludge and, and dredge sludge from ponds to restore the capacity. Uh, um, wastewater treatment plant processes is something that's sort of a growing area. Um, there's a couple of jobs in Victoria where they use the geotubes basically for, for storage without the use of flock, which can be challenging, but um, they've been doing that for years. Coastal protection, we can actually use the bags now for, for permanent buns, uh, for retaining roads, etc., for protecting coastal areas and be fully exposed to the elements. Um, removing cells, uh, contaminated solids from environments like rivers and ports, etc. And sort of more recently in Australia, at least, there's a lot of focus on tailings recovery um, or tailings storage, as I've sort of talked about. And it is a, a really a growing area of interest. Um, why do we want, want to, why would we store tailings in dewatering containers? Well, we, we're achieving a, a high cubic meter of storage per, per square meter of footprint relative to other typical methods. Maybe not necessarily mechanical drying, but solar drying, uh, wet wet tailing storage. Um, we're getting actually we're reusing water. Obviously, that's probably one of the biggest benefits. Um, so you're getting that water back to send back through the process. Um, using the tubes also allows to scale up for um, pretty heavy flows. So really, in the in the tailing space, our flows probably aren't going. Or the the projects we're working on aren't really going more than about 100 cubes an hour or say 20 to 60 tonnes of solids per hour. But if you do want to increase that, that rate, we can. And that's just by increasing the number of bags we would pump into at once. Um, you're getting a rapid dewatering effect. 99% of solids should be retained if you're getting that flock and that dosing right. Um, the geotextile pore size is quite large relative to the solids, which I may have mentioned, but um, there is a sort of a, a balance you have to get to uh, ensure you're getting a rapid dewatering uh, while maintaining or retaining the solids. If you go a finer geotextile pour, then you're going to get clogging and you're not going to get fast dewatering. So there's a bit of a balance. Um, using the geotextile also, the geotubes will also prevent rehydration. There's limited knowledge on this, I suppose, or data, I should say, but um, there's, we've had a whole heap of case studies where really <coughs> um, the geotextile, the, the solids do not get rehydrated through rainfall. And really, we're, we're trying to quantify this at the moment by doing analysis by simulating rainfall, this type of thing. So if that's an area of interest, I'm happy to discuss it further. But up till now, we really haven't had to quantify it because contaminated spoil generally gets taken off site immediately. But if it's going to remain there, then that's something that's going to be considered. Uh, mitigating airborne dust particles, um, pretty important. Low CO2 footprint relative to mechanical, and I'll, I'll get into that. Makes capping enclosures simple and cost effective um, and significantly reduces environmental risk. And that's probably the biggest area for us. You know, 
enclosing the tailings, making it dry, really limiting the, the failure risk um, and exposure to the, to the elements. Uh, general, uh, sort of a few misconceptions, common misconceptions. Um, pressure can be relied on to limit filling of the dewatering containers. That's, that's inaccurate. I mean, we would like to be able to do that, but because of the nature of the geotextile, um, we can't rely on pressure in the bag as it doesn't translate to pressure in the pipe. So you've got a porous, porous bag. So really the only option is for us to, to monitor fill heights to limit filling of the bags. So that is a, a manual process, but there are methods like lasers and, and string lines and stuff like that that we can use. Uh, the geotextile pore size should be smaller to filter fine material, which is another sort of misconception I've explained why already. Um, I can refill the bag once it's dried and set. Again, that's not necessarily true. It depends on the solids type. Uh, you don't want to refill it too often if you've left it sit there for too long because you can get this dried thing, uh, you can get the material dried and it's called a width restraint effect where you get, where you basically can't refill the bag because it's set like cement. But that tends to have to take, could be two, three, four, 12 weeks, depending on the incoming material um, type. A set and forget system, I've sort of explained why we can't, can't do that. A platform should be sloped for drainage. Again, you would think that that's a benefit, but in this case, you really want to limit slope the fall. It's got to be level across the width of the bag and about one in 200 or 0.5% down the length of the bag. And that just really prevents the bags from sloping and rolling and potentially failing. Um, and a lot of people prefer to use this, or well, one would like to use the same polymer used for the thickness um, that they've already got on site if, it's, if they're looking at an alternative method. But in many cases, it's really not going to work. And I'm just going to, just to detail, I suppose, why. If you're looking at that photo on the right, that's the same material at the same solids percentage. And you can see the quality, if you can see it, it's not that clear, but the quality, I suppose, of the, the sheer performance, the, the solid size there is, is vastly different. So the one on the left is with the, uh, the polymer from the clar clarifier or the, the, the polymer they use for, the, um, for settling out the tailings in a tailings dam. And then you've got a couple of other types. So it, it really is important to get that flock right for the geotubes. And stacking angles, number seven, stacking angles will be similar to a typical wet, wet tailing storage facility. Um, again, that's not quite true because we can't necessarily go as steep with the bags at this point. You've got about a one in three on some, one side and a one in five maximum on the other side. And that's due to the nature of the, the width of the bags and the stacking configuration. A couple of do's and don'ts. You should always be measuring max fill height uh, from the lowest point. Otherwise, uh, you are going to be, if you're measuring from the highest point, you're obviously going to be overfilling at the lowest point. Um, if you've got this, if you get this V-notch effect as shown in this, um, this bottom diagram, you should be measuring from the lowest point as well to the maximum height, because that's the critical depth. Uh, this one here is probably a site that was, uh, had a fall going too steep down the length of the bag. I think it was one or one and a half percent, slightly, slightly over the 0.5 percent recommended now you can see them starting to slope there which is not ideal so just just tells you how, how important it is to get those levels right cleaning bags just using a pressure hose pretty typical pretty typical maintenance and, uh, procedure for declogging and promoting this um, rapid dewatering there's a video here i'll show you uh, of a customer or dredging operator of ours we work with in in victoria who um, working on a biosolids job showing the importance of basically wetting it and you'll see the geotube drop down in height here as he's, as he's hydrating the, the surface. There's no noise, which is good. Um, but you can see if you watch the sun there, this bag drops in height over this, probably the space of an hour or so, which it probably would do, but it would do a lot slower if he wasn't cleaning that. And that is a biosolids job. So they're, the, uh, they're the, probably the most difficult and challenging job, jobs to work with in terms of um, particle size. And this is another video showing importance of flocking and, and particle size. So I'll just show you a couple of videos. So you can see it's, it's a large flock there. You might be used to seeing materials settle out as opposed to binding like that, but that is the, that's the target we're trying to achieve. Again, that might be a biosolids job, but that is the, uh, the aim we're looking for. Now, in terms of just comparing, directly comparing a mechanical filtered tailings to geotube tailings. We're looking at energy costs. Energy costs is obviously a big, um, a big consideration. You've got 
generally using about a third or a half the energy costs for using a geotube stack. Obviously, there's a whole range of other things we need to consider, but if we're looking directly at energy usage, it is going to be cheaper for the geotube farming versus mechanical drying. Flocculants, um, flocculants are going to be pretty similar uh, in terms of the type if you're using a belt filter press system as you would be for a geotube system. So that's really much, much of a muchness. Uh, lining and that bottom left photo is just indicating about lining costs and earthworks costs. It really depends on, on the size of the stack. So in some cases it would be cheaper for a, um, a belt filter press type system for the fact that you could might be able to go a steeper stack and go higher as opposed to a geotube stack where you might need to make it a bit more gentle, which would basically increase your footprint required. Now I've left a nice little manpower reference in here, but manpower is quite a lot of manpower required for geotube deployment, which which is always a, a question. But you know, for a large geotube stack, we're probably talking four four people generally for a you know three hundred fifty thousand tailings per annum project. Um, and I'm, I'm sure for a mechanical drying method, it may, it may be similar, to be honest. But when you're comparing to wet tailing storage, it's obviously very, very minimal required. And then CO2 emissions. We do have a, a calculator that's available for our customers that we actually, will actually look at um, different aspects, and I'll run through that in a minute. Uh, so this calculator actually does consider specifically belt filter press uh, drying versus geotextile tubes and this was done this particular study was done based on a, a china chinese project for dredging of about 2.4 million cubes of slurry uh, but you can see that all the things i won't run through it all but you can see the things they actually do consider it's it's the activities which is geotube dewatering it's the capping and the construction of the platform you've got your materials consumed and you've got your energy consumption and then when you're looking at belt filter uh, there's a few more activities in terms of haulage of dewater material to landfill. You've got mobilisation of belt filter presses. You've got construction of those things. You've got materials consumed again and energy consumption. And this particular project, which I mentioned in China, they went through and quantified all of these all these materials to compare the two. Uh, there's another page to this, which I won't I won't show, but um, basically, if if you do want us to look at carbon footprint calculator versus mechanical drying versus geotextile tubes. We can do that and we can get those inputs from you to make a fair, fair uh, comparison. And for this particular project, basically, and it's pretty common actually, looking at about 20 to 30% um, CO2 emissions reduced by using a geotube system versus a mechanical drying system. And that really doesn't include the impacts of removing certain components to landfill, like deconstructing the concrete structure, which, which would be considerable. And, and again, it depends on what you're planning to do with that, with the material after. Are you planning to, to sell off all that dried tailings or are you planning to cap it and bury it? And just looking at limitations and risk of, of geotube uh, farming, basically, um, we've set a limit of about 400,000 tonnes of tailings per annum and that really comes down to the labour. Um, we have limited experience or exposure in Australia to this yet, but we're setting a limit at this point. I mean, we've, we've talked to a number of companies that want to uh, look at operations that are going to have larger volumes than that, but we do need to start somewhere. So we've started, started with that sort of figure. Uh, and that, as I said, it's due to that manual labour component. Uh, you need ongoing management and monitoring, which may be something that, that people are, are less familiar with for a waste facility. Um, undulating sites and earthworks can be quite costly if you've got a remote site, but again, it's going to be the same for a mechanical drying um, feasibility, even for, for wet storage, wet tailing storage. But in wet tailing storage, you probably don't need to, to cut it so flat. Um, stacking angles must be a consideration and we, and we really don't want to go too steep. We want to limit those, which means you're going to reduce your storage per square meter of footprint and over, overfilling containers. That's probably one of the biggest risks, but at the same time, you are essentially limiting the failure volume to individual bag volumes. You're not going to get multiple failures at once. You might be filling one bag. So you are limiting the risk of those failures. Uh, and it's a new concept, so it's going to take time for people to get used to. But I mean, we're, 
we're going in the right direction. I think there's a lot of people who are taking interest and um, we're happy to provide support. And that is, that is a key. You've got to look for suppliers that have experience in the right applications. Uh, this, this project here you might be familiar with, Brumadinho. I'll just, there's only two slides left, but Brumadinho uh, mine, where most of you would be familiar with, they had a failure. Uh, that's an over, over or an bird's eye view of, of the failure. Quite disastrous. They had I think, 200 deaths and, and huge economical and financial um, impacts. But they've used geotubes there to remediate, and they've been doing that for a while now. Um, that's the picture on the right there. They had, I think, they were pumping or dredging from the from the failed failed area or the river uh, at twenty percent solids, flocking it, putting it into the bags, and they were getting about eighty percent solids iron ore uh, within about two weeks, and it's been really successful. And that's about it. So thanks, thanks for listening. I'll, I'll hand you on to Charles, and he'll be able to sort of give you a perspective from the, um, I suppose, from the eyes of a consultant and a designer in the mining space. Thank you, Ben, for your input. I would now like to welcome our second speaker, Charles Villiers. Charles Villiers is Principal Engineer with Mincor and founder of the Circular Mine Consortium. Charles has been working collaboratively with Geofabrics and 10K for more than two years on some Australian and international mining projects with a focus on tailings dewatering using geotube technology. Please join me in welcoming Charles Villiers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so, as discussed before, I'm a geotechnical engineer, um, and I'm, I'm, I provide. I mean, I provide technical advice uh, to a company called uh, Minco. They acting mostly in the mining industry, and I also co-founded um, the Second Man Consortium, which is a template used for this presentation. Um, and the, the, basically, the, this company focuses on um, the sustainable um, management of mine waste. Now, today, it's not really a formal presentation. It's more a, a, an introduction, if you want, or, or I would have liked that to be a discussion, but I need to start by an introduction. And then, hopefully, that presentation or that introduction will lead to further discussion um, uh, within the mining community. So here is just a it's just a photo of a of a mine site. Obviously, that's just to remind us how important or, or present the um, water is on a mine site. So it's really um, a very it's 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 a very um, important part of mining water. So that's why I mean that needs to be managed. Uh, and and I think that because of you know the, the the changes in the industry and and the trend towards more um, sustainable, um, we need to um, do or think of different ways of managing waste and water on a, on my side because of the the impact it has. And on that presentation, I'll be just of providing you an overview of the of the current stage of the uh, current state of the tenings tellings uh, management uh, but also the impact it has on the environment and local communities and also I mean presenting an alternative and how this alternative could be uh, should be really uh, viewed by the community overall or the stakeholders so Here's just a here's just a, an overview of the the tailings um, the tailing storage facilities around the world. Okay, so currently there is probably about three thousand five hundred um, large uh, tailing storage facilities. By the way, a lot of them, a lot of these uh, facilities are comes under the form of a tailings dam. So that's so it's the tailings are stored into a um a, a tailings facility so it's stored wet basically okay and that's why there are issues with it um now about if we had also that i'm talking about the large um tailing storage facilities but now if we had like smaller ones we probably have around ten thousand. and if we had into the the mix the uh, abandoned or closed the tailings facilities then we're looking at and 100,000, and it's probably an understatement. 
I, I could be out by a factor of 10, okay? But because I remember that just you know, in Queensland, for example, there's about 30,000 um, abandoned mine sites. It's the same, and maybe more in WA and Victoria. And, and then if you had other mining regions like in America, Americas, okay, but Asia and Africa and even Europe, uh, you'll see that it probably is probably more like a million uh, of them all up. So it's quite large. Now, out of the, I was mentioning before that most of the, the staling storage facility use tailings dams. But there's a small portion, and it's really an increasing proportion, which is called dry stack. So dry stack is not really completely dry. It's more like filter tailings. Okay, so it's it's a it's a great system. And what I, the the option or so the solution I'll be discussing today falls into that category. No, the impact it has um, on its environment basically uh, because tailings dams. They prone to embankment failure, um, so and, and spillage, or so it's been recorded something like in the order of about 200 failures over the last 50 or 60 years. Most more um, uh, importantly, there's been uh, over about 2,000 casualties over this um, period of time, which is concerning. Um, now we have probably about 20, 20,000 kilometers of river streams been polluted. Uh, then after that, there's been about, and I'm talking about, for example, um, dams or lakes, or there's been about 72,000 hectares of um, of this uh, water being polluted. And the other one, which is hard to quantify, is the impact on underground water. Underground water, in fact, it's hard to measure, to monitor properly. Um, so there's been there is it's been a, a significant impact. I just don't know exactly how much. Um, and to give you just an idea of the volume of waste which is produced uh, every year by the mining industry, which is the the highest uh, volume or or mass, if you want, if you prefer. Uh, so we are looking at about 100 billion tons of waste rock and tailings. And it's mostly uh, uh, West Rock, okay, but the um, maybe the the, the tailings uh, represent about ten percent of this mass, which is significant. When we know, for example, that we compare that to the to the concrete industry, uh, they uh, they use about forty billion tons of aggregates every year around across the world. So as you can see, it's um, it's a quite significant. Um, now going to the next uh, slide. Uh, so here is just to give you an overall um, view of the different type of tailings facilities. Um, and then, so as I explained before, 80% of them are tailings dams. Okay, the rest are uh, filter tailings. I think there's also in pit deposition. Uh, some of the tailings are used also, for example, for underground mine. So there's a small proportion there, and that should grow more. That's what we would like to see. But at the moment, out of the tailings dams, um, probably about 40% is upstream. So I put a little diagram on the right-hand side. So you see the, the upstream um, technology or solution, if you want. So you see the dark embankment. That's the first embankment. And then the next raise is built on the top of the what we call the tailings beach on the upstream part. So that's one. Uh, it's it's actually um, it's 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 what's been used uh, uh, most uh, more extensively. Then after that we have the downstream raise. So uh, so the downstream, as you can see, the expansion of the embankment is outside um, of the tailing dam. So you see again the dark embankment, which is the first one, and the next one is going downstream. And if you would like to see, for example, an equivalent that would be um, a filter tailing stack, it would be just the dark one. Basically, that's all it is. It's like that, but it would be a lot bigger. Okay, going to the next slide. So here is just an overview of the of the um, of the different aspect of these big, large families. Okay, so I've added another one which is small at this stage, but is 
I think will grow, which is a filter attaining stack. Um, and the solution I will be discussing today, which is using the geotextile bags, uh, falls in that category as well. So if you can see for the upstream, it's if you remember, it's like a skin really going up. So it's it's fairly low cost. Um, it's the it's also it's it's quite useful into remote areas, stable. Um, for example, if it's if it's a, a seismic free zone, it's 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 probably a good system. Uh, now the weakness is embankment, and when there is an embankment, the threat is the the, the the, the risk is very high. The consequence of this failure can be um, uh, extreme. And we'll see that in the next slide. Now, the downstream uh, rays, um, so it's it's a lower risk. It's a lot bigger, massive um, embankment. So if there's a failure, it's still possible. It's unlikely to completely fa uh, fail. Uh, so that means the the risk uh, or the consequence of this failure is, is a little bit smaller. And if we look at the filter tailing stacks, so it's, it's actually because a lot of the water is removed early, and it's 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 really it's, it increases. I mean, the result is an increased density of the tailings being stored, um, and also uh, it's also got an early water recovery, which is great because you know one of the issue with um, large tailings dams is you have all the water. All, all of that water um, evaporates. So it's a little bit less affected. It's less affected by evaporation. No problems, it's, it's dust, it's energy consumption, uh, there's mechanical. And the threat is you still can have slope stabilities, especially if you are into difficult topography and in um, seismic uh, regions, and there's also dust. If I go to the next slide, so the next slide, is, it's probably more focusing on the tailings dams here. Um, and it just highlights the, um, the main uh, reasons of failure of those tailings uh, a solution. Uh, as you can see, earthquakes and sub stability, and they, they, are, they can be related. Okay, so it's not like it's, it's, in, it's one and two, it's, it can be the two combined together. Uh, but but basically these two areas are uh, these two um, uh, slope stability and earthquakes are the, the the main concerns for these solutions. Telling them, uh, usually especially with the upstream rise. Now if I go to the next slide, so here is just an overview of the uh, what is used to assess the risk of telling asteroid facility is the consequence of the failure. Okay, and that's described very well in the end cold. And here is just a, it's just a brief overview. So my apologies, it doesn't go into a lot of details because that's not really the topic of that presentation. But um, it just gives you a feel for it. Okay, so um, as you can see, uh, the the consequence category. So there's two main consequence category. One is the embankment failure, and two is spillage. Okay, so if you look at the uh, embankment and the result, if you want, and it's mostly the embankment failure, which has the, the worst consequences. Um, but for very low, there is no casualty, and the cost. And I'm talking about the cost. It's it's the cost of uh, the cost to the to what happens. The the consequences of the failure, casualties and destruction and and pollution. And in the meantime, also there's an impact on the mining company. Because when there's a failure, that means it affects investors, lose confidence in a, in a company, and also uh, there is also cost to repair, and also loss of production, and that can amount to from very low to less than 10 million to more than 1 billion, and so it's got the potential to actually completely bankrupt a company. Uh, and and you see on the left hand side there is um, uh, the proportion of percentage of um, the categories and that's related to telling to tellings down here because that's the greatest um, that's the largest uh, solution employed or used on the mine side and as you can see the 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 extreme to high risk or consequence sorry is actually more than fifty percent of the overall solution. So 
And on the other hand, you got the lower, um, which is a small portion. What we want is to make sure we reduce that uh, that uh, that uh, I to extreme proportion, and that's possible. Uh, now moving to the next slide, so that's possible, and this is you know one example actually to uh, to reduce that risk. And it's just uh, this is here. Um, so this is using the geotextile stack. So it's basically a series of geotextile bags. Um, they can go up to 100 meters in length. Usually the diameter is like a big sausage, but it just flats. It just flattens uh, at the end. This is not actually. I don't believe this is here a, a telling storage facility. But it's used. It's been used for many years by the construction industry for dredging rivers, for example. So. It's very useful in that application, but now the idea is to actually to, to use these to store tailings because there are similarities between the tailings uh, characteristics and the, uh, the, uh, the result of dredging. And we'll come back to that slide very quickly. So I think that's, that's probably the same slide on the same um, site that you saw before. So this is a view again of this, um, of this uh, stack. Of this facility you see people uh, standing on the top so it's fairly safe no people when you can see them uh, standing on that there is a bit of water so because it's still full of water so when they discharge the tailings it's pretty much the same as discharging the tailings down okay so it's it's the um, uh, there is um, um, maybe uh, uh, sorry there's a large it's it's quite liquid basically okay so they so the content is probably around 30%. So, um, so that when it goes in, however, these geotextiles, they are fibers uh, and they got, uh, it's, it's more like a filter. So water uh, drains out and you can see actually on the left hand side, so the little um, ladders, uh, yellow uh, to, for the, um, uh, the crew to, to go and go to the top of the, of the bags. Um, okay. So that's, that's just, an, uh, that's just to show what it looks like. Um, here's also, it's just stacked, so it can be stacked quite well. So you can see here um, the um, another view of a stack. On the left-hand side, you see also um, a, a diagram. Um, you know, that's, that's uh, described how it's being stacked. So it's the stack sitting onto a layer of uh, gravels, uh, which allows the drainage of the bags. And then it's usually sitting on a platform, uh, which can have a small slope, uh, and it's lined, and in it, it's all around the platform. There is a drain that captures the the the, the, um, the water and then directs that to, for example, a, a pond uh, that can be used to pump the water back into the plant, for example. Now that's just to uh, just to show um, what it looks like. Um, no, here's, a, here's another slide. So actually we've done some tests. So that shows here um, on the left-hand side, you can see a, a detail of the water dripping through the bag. It's actually, it can drip quite well. Um, and actually we've done some testing here. We've used small pillow bags. So the same size as a pillow. Okay, but we did some testing on that in a lab. Um, and then it, we didn't we didn't fluculate actually the tailings. So we Notice some loss of solids, um, and the the, uh, the material uh, there was tailings, and it was a mix of um, uh, clay, silt, and fine sand, and it worked quite well. And within a few days, all the most of the water has drained out, and we were able to do some um, um, Sher Sherman test to actually uh, get some result on um, uh, geotechnical properties. And we added that also, we added also, we added another layer on the top to check also the consolidation of the material. It was quite positive. Um, and this is actually um, just an example again of um, this site. Um, and that shows, you know, the, the material here, there's a few layers. And actually, I go back to the, this is the same, I refer that to the, to the previous slide. Uh, which I'll show you as an attraction. That's that was this slide actually. That's this slide here. That is the same, um, and that that's just a, a few months after. Oops, sorry, I'm just going the wrong way. Um, 
so you can see here, um, this is the same again. So I think, I believe this was maybe a month or two after. And because it's in a region where there's a lot of um, rainfall, uh, you can see also the grass really growing rapidly on the top. And you can see here uh, someone I know actually sitting on the top of this material, which seems to be you know quite clay because of the uh, of the of the cracks on the top. Um, now this is another another picture showing how compact the material can be. Um, so that's this is really um, th this works quite well even on the large scale, not just the pillow back size. Uh, and this is another, I think that's, I don't have the details of this, by the way, this photo has been provided to me by Sol Max. Okay, and so this is red mud, I believe. So um, this also, I was able to dewater that reasonably well. No, just, um, just to um, sort of frame all this uh, solution into a table, um, I've, I've provided, I mean, sorry, I prepared here that pro and cons. So at the moment, the pro is long, the con is not very long as yet, but because remember, it's reasonably new um, applied to the to the tailing storage. So that will grow as we, that solution become used more and more, hopefully. Um, and you can see, so on the pro side, so it's, it's basically a filtration tailings. It goes reasonably quick to, uh, to um, drain the, 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 the water out. So very quickly, that tailings become fairly compact. Uh, there's no dust issue here because it's all confined in the bags. Uh, there's no stable stability or not much because it's the, 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 the geotextile itself brings some um, reinforcement and it becomes similar to reinforced earth uh, in terms of design for a geotechnical design. So it's got a reduced footprint because there's no need for an embankment, okay? Uh, there's also a high density, so the material is quite compact, so you store more per square meter. And there's no mechanical part, also, which is really good when you compare that, to, for example, to a filtration plant. There's also good water recovery, and it's a very safe system, okay? And on the con side, uh, the, so the layout, so you, you have basically this, uh, uh, we're limited in terms of geometry, so it's, it can be a bit tricky to organize it properly, especially when it's not like a nice rectangular platform. Uh, operation side also, we need to have a crew which is reasonably well uh, trained uh, to do this because you don't want to lose one bag. Um, and I think as Ben explained before, there is also the, the, all these cycles, uh, recycling, so that needs to be done reasonably well, controlled well, and when you had Loads, it also needs to be to be well organized and when the, the first layer is organized it's got to be done in, in a certain way if it's not done that a certain way then the first if the first layer is not really well leveled then the next one on the top will be will become more and more problematic and then there's a logistic uh, because these bags have to be transported to the mine site so if they are for example um, fabricated in Asia and they have to go to the middle of Africa, it can be quite challenging. So as against, uh, you know, for example, the tellings dam where most things will be local, will be done locally. No, just just also the, the four key points which are highlighted on the right hand side of this uh, slide. It shows that really um, it brings the risk level of a tellings facility to a very low uh, consequence category. And I'm happy to discuss with that further and I'll do that in the next slide. It's also got a smaller um, environmental footprint. It's got a smaller water footprint and a small carbon footprint as well. Now next, so why reduce uh, consequence category? Well, you can imagine if there's an embankment failure because they have, it's all bricks basically put together, the tailings, when the first layer is laid down, uh, we, it, we wait until the water has drained and, and it's safe to put the ne another layer on the top. So that means there's, a, a, the, 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 if you want, the liquid state of the tailings is very minimal and it's in terms of time and even in volume because it's all separated into a tailings dam. So, oh, into, a, sorry, not a tailings dam, a, a bag, a, te a geotextile bag. So if that geotextile bag fell, it's quite limited in terms of 
in terms of um, um, impact. Okay, because remember there is a line platform and there is a trench that can be designed to collect, for example, the failure of one bag, should that happen. Um, so it's fairly limited. Um, and then in terms of spillage, same as a result, it's all, it's all confined to a, telling, to a, a, a bag itself. So if at worst one bag will fail, that's it. That's, that's the only issue you, you will have to face. So it's low consequence category. Now, um, here's it's a bit of a repeat of the previous one. Um, what's important in, in here is the last point um, on the table, on a, on a square, uh, where I'm, I'm, this sort of, um, and this is something that's, a, that's really a comment for the, uh, also the legislator. So we would like to see that sort of solution, that sort of solution included into the guideline. Okay, so mostly it's about telling us down, but what about including uh, that sort of filter, filter tellings, uh, and also uh, using geotextile bags and maybe recycling, for example, the tellings. So all these solutions should be should be included into the guideline. And so there's a bit of work to, to do because if it is there, then the mind will be will have to think about this, and so will the consultant. They will have to say, okay, so let's there, that's another solution that we need to consider when we develop a mine, um, where we design a mine, or where we look at you know, the management of the tenants. Now, uh, just some financial considerations. So in terms of CapEx, so basically you only buy the bag when you need the bag. Okay, so okay, so yeah, it's not as simple as this, obviously, but it's very progressive. Uh, there is low init uh, initial preparation cost. It's basically a platform, lined, uh, drains, bond. Um, and then, but it's also region dependent. So, as, as explained before, if it's in the middle of Africa, it may be a little bit more complicated than if it's in uh, in Australia. For example, we look at Victoria; that's a lot easier to then consider that sort of solutions. Uh, same in Queensland or WA, or and some site in uh, Europe or uh, Asia or Latin America, Canada. That, that's solution that could be used, and I think they already be used in Canada, by the way. Now, in terms of OPEX, it's, it can be labor intensive, uh, especially when you lay down the bags and put the next layers. And now the layer goes up, becomes a little bit more complex. So you need people. Uh, and so the bag installation, as a result, is, is not straightforward. So you need to have a well-trained crew to, do, to, do, to run that um, efficiently. Uh, now, on the plus side, it's also low energy um, because as compared to a filtration plant again. Um, now, in terms of uh, others, uh, it's because it's already confined, the closure costs are usually considered to be low. Um, there's also low externality. So what I, what I think about when I, uh, externalities I mean by that, things we do not consider into, into feasibility. So basically we don't price the risk. For example, on the, on the mine, on the feasibility study, we never, we don't include the cost related to um, a dam failure, for example, because if we would, you would realize that uh, using telling exam is actually, can be extremely expensive. Um, and then, but we should, we should certainly include this into the cost of uh, operating a mine. And then it's because it's it, such a low, um, a uh, low risk, so that means it provides better protectability, which is a real advantage when you when you have to present the project to the community and pr present the project as well to the investors com community. So it, it's it's probably a lot more attractive for everyone to to see that actually that aspect, which is which is uh, normally reasonably risky, we can actually offer a solution which has a really low risk profile. Uh, so in conclusion, um, I'd say this, uh, adopting a solution like that, for example, is it's really, it's, it's a very safe way. And so that should be really considered. And I'm going to the last point. We have to include this uh, sort of solution into our mindset to make sure that we include a sustainable solution. We we cannot just go and use the same solution as before. We need to change 
our our view or our way of uh, um, tackling uh, the development of a mine. And that's across the whole mining community. Um, it's also it's also a very efficient way of water recovery. So and, and again, water is a big challenge. Uh, so that really should be considered in many areas. And also, in addition to that, this is a solution. It's new. Uh, I don't think that people understand it very well. So I, I would highly recommend doing a, a small uh, pilot plant trial. For that, you need the volume of tailings, obviously. But the pillow bag is great, but it's not too small. But there are there are bags um, that are five cubic meters uh, in volume, and that's perfect. And you can create a little pyramid and do a lot of tests with that. It's cheap, and you can really prepare very efficiently the uh, the operation. And uh, so thank you very much. Look, I it's a very simple presentation, um, and it's as I said earlier, it's an introduction. So I hope that this is not the end. Uh, and this is going to open doors to more discussion. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Hi, thank you for those two great presentations. Um, it's now your turn to get involved. And I also wanted to just check, make sure you subscribe to this channel and you'll get regular updates of what's coming up. Um, if you could ask our speakers your questions via the chat box and who your question is directed to. Also, a big thank you to everyone who put questions through whilst registering. And I might start with one of those from Naresh. And Naresh is watching from Queensland, asking you, Ben, is there a minimum percentage of solids threshold for these bags? I'm looking at, looking at a percentage for solids between 2 and 10%. Also, Flocculent requirements are cationic versus anionic for better performance. Thank you, Naresh. Ben? Sure. Uh, look, it does depend on the solids, but as a minimum, generally we're looking at a minimum of about 0.5 to, to 1% uh, for, say, biosolids. But and if we're looking at biosolids, you're looking at in the range of 1% to 5% initially. If you're going lower than that, and you're really pumping too much water. Um, and you're relying on the flock too much. But uh, if you're looking at tailings, for example, you know, we're deal generally dealing with 20% to sometimes 40% solids initially. Uh, the lower end of that is better because you do get the mixing of the flock better and, and it is more efficient. Um, anything higher than 40%, you're gonna start using too much flock and you're wasting it. So if you're working around the 20% solids for tailings, that's around the mark. But in terms of flock sort of requirements, uh, I'm, I'm less familiar with the types, but we do do testing in our actual R&D lab with different flocks. We can test different slurries uh, and assess dose rates if, if need be. It just really gives you an idea of what to expect once you've strained it through the geotextile. Um, but uh, look, the higher molecular weight uh, flocks tend to work better to achieve a, a larger particle size, but that's as far as I can probably take that one. Just staying with you and also staying in Queensland, a question came in from Tim asking, Ben, do you think this technology could be applied to agricultural effluent? Hey. Uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty common. Um, we're commonly dealing with dredging contractors who are working on basically cleaning out, desludging biosolids ponds, agricultural ponds, uh, abattoir sites. So biosolids, is a challenge because it tends to want to retain moisture uh, and you're generally not getting better dried state in the bag. About 16% is the limit. It's a bit of a risk to suggest that you're going to get 18% in the bags because I've seen it seen it happen. You will get there eventually, but generally 16% with biosolids and agricultural solids um, is enough to get it to a spadeable consistency anyway. So you do need to set expectations with um, that kind of material, just to make sure that the, the stakeholder or the end customer is, is, is happy with a spadeable consistency as opposed to targeting a, a number. Thanks, Ben. And Charles, just bringing you into the conversation. Uh, and good afternoon from Robert, uh, also in Queensland. Charles is asking the question, uh, does this solution have economical use outside small tailings solutions? 
Okay. Uh, thanks, Amanda. Can you can you hear me or? Yes. Just want to... Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. So economically, it really depends what you include into your economic analysis um, in terms of direct uh, capital cost and operational cost. It is somehow probably it's got similarities with other systems. Okay, but what you need to have a look at and what I explained into the into the into the presentation it, the pro and cons um, on one hand for the same cost for example you can have a wet storage like a tailing stand with a great risk and on the other hand maybe for the same cost you have a geotextile um, um, a ta stack okay and the risk is very small so which it depends where you are really um, I'd say if you're into a remote area where the consequence of failure is very small uh, whether we're talking about the underground water the communities uh, you know it's maybe not the best solution but if you're into an area where the risk of having a failure is extremely high i would highly recommend a solution like this so that is that means if you include into your into your economy economic analysis, externalities, which is like the cost of failure, for example, and the cost of cleaning the environment and the cost related to destroying communities. Uh, this is this is very this is very cheap. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Thanks for that, Charles. And um, just talking about dollars, uh, Mohammed, good afternoon to you in New South Wales, is asking you, Ben, what is the cost of M3 treatment? Yeah, so um, per cubic meter cost of treatment. Um, look, it's a hard one to answer. It depends on the on the project. Uh, if you're talking about tailing specifically, we probably talk talk in terms of uh, dry ton storage, uh, and you've got different aspe aspects to consider. You've got the platform to design and cost and cut and line. Then you've got the cost of the tubes obviously then you've got the cost of the flock the labor uh the pumping as well so it's the bigger the job the more efficient it is um but if you then i mean and, and in reality you know the the dollar figure for a a larger stack of tubes in australia we're looking at probably 15 dollars a ton of storage if that makes sense to what your question is asking but if you're looking at um other jobs where you're actually doing a maintenance program on say a desludging a pond, for example, which is only a temporary thing or a maintenance procedure. Um, it's quite hard to predict because it, it really depends on the location. You've got mobilization costs um, and it's gonna be a temporary pad. So that, that one's really hard to predict and you'd have to, you'd have to process it up with a dredging contractor. Thanks, Ben. And just staying with you, um, and good afternoon to Norman. And Norman's watching from Queensland, who's asking you, Ben, could this method be used for dewatering sloppy organic uh, material? Thanks, Norman. Sure, it's, it's probably been answered just before where I was talking about the um, biosolids. So, yeah, we do that quite regularly. Uh, it is very challenging if there's someone dealing if there's a dredging contractor or a contractor that are working on a biosolids job that don't know what they're doing, um, it it can be a bit of a disaster. Like there's things you need to do, like cleaning the bags, agitating the surface, getting the flock pretty accurate, uh, and setting expectations as well. So um, yeah, we do it quite regularly, but you do need to get the experienced operators to do that. Thanks, Ben. And back to you, Charles. We've uh, had a great question that's come in from Ash. And Ash is, uh, Ash is asking you, Charles, would the use of geotubes continue to be a sustainable way forward for dewatering? Um, Ash, thank you for the question. Um, it's one way, okay? And it's only uh, when you look at um, the sustainable um, use of water on the mine site, I think there is certainly using it on the, on the mine storing, uh, for example, if you can reduce the uh, impact by evaporation, for example, um, you can then improve the uh, the, the utilization of, of water. Um, so 
if you use, for example, a geotextile bag, so the first thing is there is no mechanical part into using a geotube. So first, that means the carbon footprint is not as affected as if you would use, for example, a filter telling plant. And the recovery of water is pretty quick. I reckon that um, we've done some tests, some testing, and it looks like on the pillow bag, so it's a small scale uh, bag, we were able to recover like 90% of the water almost within four or five days. So that means you can recover very quickly water. And if we are able then to feed that to the decant pond, uh, that, then that can be fed to the, uh, to the plant, to the water, to the water pump, to the water pond for the plant, then you can really recycle the water quickly. Um, so it will be probably more sustainable. But, but it's just one step, what I want to say. There's other steps that needs to be included into the system to make sure it's, it's, it's more sustainable. Um, and, for example, things I really would like to say is, like, for example, recharge of underground water. It's, it's a fantastic way uh, to create actually an underground reservoir, and so which means you could actually discharge directly the, the, the water into a pond or, or, or into the into you need you may need to to uh, process to decontaminate the water and then discharge directly underground something like that. It would be a, a, even a better way to to um, make sustainable uh, use of water. Thank you, Ash. Thanks. Great question. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Um, ben, a question's come in from uh, Barry, and Barry's watching from Victoria, asking you, Ben, what a typical flocculants and or coagulants used in the dewatering process. Ben. Thanks for that one. Um, look, again, I'm less familiar with the coagulants and flocside, but as I said, we do the testing in the lab. Um, we test with a wholesaler polymer, and we do you use the anionic and cationic flocks, um, and really it's to, it comes down to the type of material. So we test a whole range. Uh, we tend to test the higher molecular weights, which have the better performance in terms of getting a better filtrate quality and a better uh, retention of solids. So we test a whole range, but um, and that's from SNF. I'll give them a bit of a plug. SNF wholesalers, they do a pretty good job, um, and they're a good support to us too with providing, I suppose, advice on what, what's going to work for what type of solid without having to test too many. Ben, ben can I have a quick comment? Charles. Ben, sure. oh, sorry. Um, we, we've just, um, we're working on a project at the moment where actually they're using also flocculants upstream for a thickener. So that means when the tailings go into the bags, there's already some flocculation um, inside the, inside the, inside the tailing. So that means it could reduce the need for further flocculation uh, before the tailings being discharged into the, into the, into the geotextile bags. That's all. Well, thanks, Charles. Thank you for that jumping in. Um, ben, we've had a question come in from Dan who is asking you, what is the native material that geotubes are made from? Is it a synthetic plastic material linked to the old industry? And how sustainable is it in the long term? Thanks, Dan. Sure. Um, so it's polypropylene. Uh, and it's non-biodegradable. So, you know, this particular material has probably a half-life of eight to 10 years when exposed to the UV. But in reality, if we're using it for dewatering uh, and you're really trying to maintain that function of the strength and the, I suppose, the dewatering mechanic for two weeks in reality or maybe a month. Uh, but if you are stacking, we want... Or well, in the case of tailings, we generally want it to actually retain the strength and maintain its in, in capture properties and capturing properties for the life of that stack. Like we're going to we're probably going to bury the stack eventually, um, but you really need to maintain it so the tailings don't get rehydrated through rainfall. Um, so we and we we have looked at biodegradable materials before, but it's well, it's pretty risky, really. Um, Risky in terms of failures are going to be more common. Uh, you, in the case of tailings, we want it to last a lot longer than, than most other applications. Um, and seam strength, you can't really rely on strength, seam strength if you've got a biodegradable material. That might change eventually. At the moment, obviously, the polyprop is recyclable itself. So if you do 
cut it open and give it a clean. You can recycle it, send it to your um, cycling facility, but it's probably rarely done at this at this stage. Um, uh, but yeah, in terms of the polyprop, it's virgin polyprop as well, so it's it's not recycled when we produce it, but it can be recycled, and there's reasons for that too. Like at, at this stage, getting high quality recycled polyprop is quite a challenge, particularly in Asia. In Australia, it's challenging enough, but um, it's better to stick to a virgin where you you really know those properties are going to be consistent in terms of strength. So I hope that's answering the that. question. Yeah, thank you. And hopefully that answers your question with Staffer uh, as well that came through. Um, staying with you, Ben, uh, Diana has asked a question. Um, Until this moment, the application of geo bags is for dewatering. Have you ever used these bags underwater due to the lack of space or a storage? Ben? Personally, I haven't. Um, I've seen projects where they've used bags for uh, basically creating temporary coffer dam walls where they pump it full of sand in a submerged application and then they almost shape it to protect a boat ramp in this case and then they pumped out that water from one side back into the river. Um, so that was a submerged application. But other uh, submerged applications, there's probably, they probably do it in coastal, but my concern would be ensuring that you're going to get a, a level ground um, and you're not going to obviously fit as much solids in there and it's not really going to dry so it's going to be permanently submerged so getting the the ground level enough so it's not going to roll once it's in situ is, is probably the key to that and it really depends on what you're trying to do um, are you trying to create a revetment in a submerged application or are you trying to dig water material because it's always going to be uh, saturated in a submerged environment to some degree. Ben, um, ben, ben, just uh, to co to add a comment on this, mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's, it's a great question, and it would really uh, we would need to think a bit a lot more about this. But you know, also by adding, it depends how deep it it it, it is potentially also inside in in the water, and then if you had a surcharge on the top, so at the beginning because of the um, the surcharge won't be very effective, okay, because of the uh, Archimed uh, force. But as you had more and more surcharge, the bottom part will start consolidating. I mean, the it will still be saturated, but the dry density will increase. So the the void ratio will will decrease. So it it might be it might be interesting to that's something that's certainly worth considering, but would require a bit more thinking. Yeah, um, thank you, Charles. And, and just staying with you, um, you know, Tom has come as is asking a question. Are there any potential issues that could be encountered with large scale operations? You know, we've uh, we've actually we've we've considered this um, option for a site where uh, we had to deal up to five million tons per annum of um, of a, um, tellings. Um, so that's that is a fairly large uh, a volume. Okay, if I'm actually sorry, so um, yeah, it's it really at the end the the larger what you you may need to have multiple platforms to actually being able to increase the uh, the the intake of of tellings. I think it's it's no no um, no issues. I mean, really, we can we can fix it up. It really depends on the topography and the availability of land, but obviously the higher the the, uh, the production of tailings or the discharge of tailings, the, the larger the footprint. Um, and then also you need to have a fairly large uh, uh, amount of pumping capability to, to discharge the tailings to different bags. You need to have multiple bags ready. Um, yeah, that's. I would. I would say it will require multiple platforms, it, it, up to one million tons per annum. I don't think that'd be a problem. If you go be beyond that, you may need multiple platforms. Ben, do you want to add some comments on that? Uh, and this is in terms of the um, capacity of the stack. Look, at the moment, 
Was that the size? Yeah, the, sorry, the, the, the amount of um, the volume of tailings being discharged uh, or the size of the operation, basically. If we look at a, a very big discharge, I'd say you'd need probably to have multiple platforms. Yeah, well, that's one right. I think, I think uh, at the moment we have set a limit. I think I said in the presentation, you know, looking at 400, 500,000 tonnes per annum, but of tailings, that is. If we want to go larger, you could put you could you could do that quite comfortably, but you'd have to have a second stack because really, um, when you're looking at say 400, 500,000 tons per annum, you're probably pumping it, I can't remember, maybe 100 tons per hour, uh, and you're filling tubes quite quite quickly. So you do need the the labour to be able to keep up with that um, as well. And the bags, you know, a, a bag that might be 60 metres long or a 2,000 cubic metre bag which is roughly 60 metres by 18 metres, um, they weigh about a tonne. And so you do need uh, mechanisms to be able to deploy them, whether it's just a, a mechanical winch. And so it, there's things like that you need to consider once you start getting uh, up to those larger volumes. Thanks, Ben. And then just staying with you, a question has come in. Uh, what concentration of solids in water is typically required to be fed into a geotube in order to achieve a good results, um, i.e. how wet is too wet? Um, well, I think I mentioned this earlier, I'm not sure if I answered this one, but um, we're looking at about 0. 0.5 to 1% as a minimum. So it really, there's not, nothing too wet. Well, there, it, once you start getting, dealing with solids below 0.5%, uh, maybe not for biosolids, but for the tailings, I said the tailings you're probably not expecting to deal with less than two or three percent. But um, we have done a project down in Tasmania where, we're, where the starting point was about two percent solids, even with tailings, and that was by weight. Uh, and they had really good results down there. So um, I would set the limit probably one percent on most projects in some cases, 0.5 percent for biosolids. But as I said, you, you're pumping a lot of water um, beyond that. and going to be a lot of cycling processes. Thanks, Ben. And Charles, I have a question that's come in from um, Shikar um, this afternoon asking you, has there been a comparison of complete carbon footprint of geotubes versus the traditional TSF methods, inclusive of fabric supply chain? I understand the safety benefits presented. Charles. Okay, it's, look, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question, okay? And so far, I don't think we have, I mean, Ben has addressed this into his report. I did address it, but really to do a full analysis, uh, that's right, in, including, you know, the cost of, I mean, so the footprint related to uh, fabricating the bags, transporting the bags, um, and then, so that's, that's, it is it is it it is required it is necessary we need to do that definitely we need to do that um but it's it's a complex analysis and this will be on my agenda probably very soon to do this um because i'm i'm very um i'm very interested by the carbon footprint you know, the water footprint and the carbon footprint they're really two critical areas that we need to address and so but, but for example, I'm working on a project at the moment, uh, and that's you know where we have actually we are uh, we have the intention of using a geotextile bag. But what we realize is we can actually then cut open the bags at the end, and we can and because the the the, the material the tailings are reasonably neutral and they are they've been decontaminated before being discharged into the bags, we can actually plant trees on the top. So if you plant trees on the top, then you can actually add a decarbonation uh, um, uh, part. I mean, so you can add decarbonation part to this overall solution. So we need also to include this into the equation to make sure that we do that full footprint, uh, carbon footprint calculation. So that, yeah, that's, it, it's certainly a, an interesting, um, a solution that can open opportunities for decarbonation, especially if you can use that uh, tailings as it has been dry. It's been mostly 
um, it's been, I mean, a lot of water has been removed so that you can actually transform the tailings into organic soil. Thanks, so that's. So just moving uh, on. Yeah, now. I could add to that. Yeah, yeah, please add to that. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, so I, I think I just went through briefly that uh, carbon footprint calculator in the presentation, which I haven't had much experience with myself, but we do have access to it. And but it does compare purely uh, mechanical drying to or built filter press to the geotube system. And they do analyse a whole range of things, and I think they do consider supply chain of fabric in that but they don't consider um landfill at the back end but from what what's been suggested the deconstruction of a mechanical system with concrete etc uh, outweighs impacts to the landfill for a geotube so from what i've from what i gather um but yeah we'd be more than happy to work with anyone if they wanted to look into that uh, or at least give this software a go um, if, it was, if there's interest. Thank you. Thanks for that, Ben. And, and just moving on to the topical issue of supply, uh, Naresh has put forward a question to you, Ben. Um, how readily are the geofabric bags available in terms of supply? Ben, are you happy to answer that one? Sure. Uh, look, we, we, well, geofabrics have branches all around the country, so we tend to hold some stock. It depends on what volumes you're looking at. Um, you know, we might have three, four containers of stock around the country, but if you're ordering new stock, it's got to come out of uh, Zuhai, China or Malaysia. Uh, shipping is improving, to be honest. It's actually getting a lot better, especially out of Asia. So generally lead times are about six to eight weeks on, on new stock, uh, which isn't bad considering I'm still waiting for, for a lot of material after four to six months. But in terms of the geotubes and stuff coming out of Asia, it's, it's not too bad. Thanks, Ben. And just staying with you for a second, we had a question coming from Johnson. Good afternoon to you, Johnson, asking you, Ben, do you have information about chemical resistance on caustic slurry, e.g. used lime? Um, not maybe not specifically with the tubes, but we do have a lot of data on polyprop in general, polypropylene. So, but if there is any questions, I'd yeah, suggest you follow up with me by email and we'd be happy to do actually immersion testing in the lab, which is something we've, we've developed recently in terms of our expertise. So we could actually do some immersion testing and assess it, but it also depends on uh, why, do, why do you want to do it? Because the bags really, in some cases, only need to last for three months. Uh, and there's a lot of data to suggest the polyprop would uh, last in low and high pHs for a, a lot longer than that. So if you're stacking, I, I do get it though. It's got to be enclosed for longer periods to avoid rehydration. But um, yeah, more than happy to discuss that one further. Yeah, thank you. And just staying with you, Ben, for a second. Um, uh, Questions come in uh, from Mark. It was saying, uh, thank you very, very much for very informative presentations. Ben, are there actually any entities in the commercial reuse of tailings, such as input into construction material manufacturing and the agri industry? Ben? Well, that's probably one's perfect for Charles, but I will just say um, there's a Charles, site. You can comment too. That had, yeah, I'll let Charles go as well in a sec, but I think. There's a site we're looking at, which is an agricultural mining operation, uh, and they've been looking at, they've been storing tailings in a tail, wet, tail, wet storage tailings facility for a long time. Um, and now they want to consider using dry, drying the material because it actually has value. So there's a lot of value in some of the product, as you say. So, but I'll let Charles uh, answer that one. Sorry, I'm not, I, I missed the question. Yeah, so the, the question that's come in is, are there actually any entities in the commercial reuse of tailings, um, such as input into construction material, manufacturing and the agri industry? Agriculture. Okay. okay. Yes. Um, yes. It is very much a, um, a, not a developed, not a very well developed solution, but there are, I'm, I'm working actually on similar solutions at the moment. Um, 
And using geotextile bags is a great step uh, towards being able to re recycle the tailings into construction material and soil aggregates. And you can also, depending on the characteristics of the tailings, you can also do um, some carbon sequestration. Um, so there are many solutions coming up. Uh, I don't think it's we don't we don't have yet a solution which considers completely the recycling of the tailings, but they, we are able technically to do it. Certainly, uh, we we can uh, reuse. We've worked on a project that was in Latin America where we were able to demonstrate that. 80% of the tailings could be recycled in um, agroforestry activity um, and also forming aggregates for the construction industry. And that was including as well carbon sequestration. It's a great solution. Okay, it's it's a few, it's definitely there is it's a solution that we're gonna have to really think harder and and consider at the start of a mining project right from there. Yeah, from, right from the start, that should really be considered. It's, it's, a, it's a great question. Thank you. And as always, we've, we're almost out of time, but I just wanted to ask you both, um, starting with you, Ben, um, what do you think are the major trends we're going to see in this field in the next few years? Obviously, the world's seen a lot of change in the last couple of years. Um, what, what major trends do you think is going to come out? Um, look, if, if you're looking specifically at dewatering and, and tailings management, I think uh, there's going to be a significant change. The tailings guide, the ANCOG tailings guide changed recently and it was quite a significant change in terms of risk management and it makes it a lot more challenging to design sites, as I understand it, or design and I'd get approval for wet storage of tailings. So. That means a lot of sites are going to have to start looking at dry stacking, whether it's geotubes or mechanical drying. Um, so, I, and I'm already we're already seeing it. We're, we're getting a lot of inquiries, you know, weekly at the moment about looking at solutions, not just for dewatering process tailings, but you know, um, storing tailings which has already been placed there because the tailings facility can't get approval to do tailings, dam, raises. So they need temporary solutions um, to fill the gap while that, so they can keep producing. So there's a whole range of uses. Mm. Thanks. Charles, what do you think we can see coming down the pipe? Uh, look, just uh, at the moment, there is a huge focus on sustainability and, and making sure that, and safety. Uh, it's really, we don't want to see any more failures and investors don't want to see that. Communities want to be safe. We, we need to protect the environment. We need to protect the underground water. So we need to find systems. We, we need to basically try to reduce the number of tailings dams. And this is a great solution like the geotextile bags in order to, to really improve, reduce the footprint because as you can see, you know, we can increase the density of tailings being stored into, into the bags. We can recover water. It's it's not mechanical. It's it's got it's it's actually safe in terms of slope stability. So this is this is probably one of the best solution at the moment we can think of. And also, if you add to this the possibility to, to recycle the, the tailings, okay, and maybe reuse some of the geotextile into other applications like road construction, it's it's a great solution. So that we'll see. I, I hope that. Most engineers, um, when they design, uh, when they look after, you know, when they do a, a concept for tailings um, management on the mine site, I hope they will be they they will consider solutions like that. This is this is this is a, a new uh, solution that we have, and we need to add that to our to our range of solutions. Okay, and this is also and that also will come from the legislator. We're going to make sure that legislator really take that solution and include that into, into the guidelines. We'll see that, I, I have no doubt, that, that, that is the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for those insights. And, and it is all we have time for today. So please join me once again in thanking Ben Lewis and Charles Villiers for their time and input. 
I'd also like to give a warm thank you to Engineers Australia's industry partner, Geofabrics, for their ongoing support. Um, please complete a short feedback form. It takes a couple of minutes, which is linked in the description box below. Help us improve and plan for future sessions. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at our next Thought Leads Leaders event. Thank you and good afternoon.